I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Armin Rapinian, who will be talking about incorporating lymphedema into the venous practice. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so this is who I am. I have no disclosures to report. So I'm going to ask the question whether it makes sense to incorporate lymphedema into your practice, and that's uh, not a rhetorical question. Hopefully I'm going to answer that. But I'm going to also ask those of you out there, raise your hands if you're in an outpatient uh, medical setting like a vein clinic. Well, it looks like I'm preaching to the choir, so let's see if I can convince you that lymphedema makes sense. Um, so I think I may have uh, um, jumped ahead of here a little bit. Uh, so successful outpatient practice will consist of superficial venous disease uh, and the diagnosis and management of chronic deep vein thrombosis. Uh, let me just look here because I think that um, what's going on there? I think this is an old... Um, We'll make our way through it, though. Um, hang on, folks. We'll come back next year. No, no. Okay, so we're going to talk about incorporating lymphedema into your practice. Hopefully this will be. Does it make sense for you to incorporate lymphedema into your practice? I said it's, that won't be rhetorical. I'm going to hopefully answer that. Uh, and I asked how many of you have independent uh, practices, and almost the majority of people did raise the hand to that. I'm going to ask a non-rhetorical a rhetorical question, and that is, what do you think the future of a vein practice is, especially those of you who are early in your careers? Is it enough to say that I'm a specialist in the treatment of superficial veins and expect that to have sustainability? The way I've worded that question, I think you know what I think the answer is. There's been a recent change, as most of you know, in the specialty board designation from phlebology to the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine. And that change reflects an understanding that there's only one system, the venous lymphatic system. And those of you who doubt that, although I doubt if there is anyone out there, this quote from B.B. Lee and Hugo Parch sort of uh, summarizes that. I have to say as a disclosure, I am on the board of directors of the ABVLM. And with, the, with that understanding that there's only one venal lymphatic system, uh, we developed a core, uh, a core content was developed for training in, uh, in venous and lymphatic disease. And that core content, I should say, is evolving. And those of you who have sat for the ABVLM exam, you know that. The reading list, the core content is, uh, does have lymphatic disease in it, and we're going to see that evolve as well, especially with a new board member on the ABVLM who happens to be uh, on my left. I think we're going to see more incorporation of lymphedema. I will say, though, that my opinions uh, are, you know, are my own. I have no inside information. And along those same lines, the board is in the process of expanding fellowship training programs uh, in uh, both venous and lymphatic medicine. And the reason for that is the goal is for subspecialty recognition, an ABMS rec uh, recognition. And my personal opinion is that once the economic rivalries sort of fall by the side, that will be inevitable. And why do I tell you that? I tell you that because it follows the same vascular track that those of you who are new in your careers are going to see that at some point there are going to be people who are boarded, ABMS boarded, in venous and lymphatic medicine, and that's going to be their credential. So I think, you know, if that's not caught your attention, hopefully it will, and I can make the argument why now's the time to get involved in lymphatic disease. So what will it take to uh, incorporate lymphedema in your practice? There's a thread that's going to run right through this talk, and that is commitment. And the first commitment is expanding your knowledge base and understanding of the pathophysiology of these disease processes. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, the bottom line is that uh, I like to say primary care doctors don't understand the difference. It's up to you to, to, to learn about lymphedema and be able to, uh, to perform as what I call primary care providers in lymphedema. You are a primary care provider. It's your job to ask the question why, because many times the patients that we see, no one has ever bothered to ask the question why, and to put together a treatment plan to help that uh, patient. So it's a commitment from you and your staff in dealing with a unique subset of patients who can express sadness, anger, and even look at the established medical community with some suspicion. 
They have commonly been pushed aside, frequently told there's nothing that can be done for them. And that has to start with the first uh, person who answers the phone in your practice, all the way to, uh, to your ancillary medical staff. And when you come in and meet that patient and you express the interest and the time that they uh, really deserve to try to understand the problems that they, are going, uh, that they have and also what they are going to. It's a commitment in venous ultrasonography as well. And I say that because whether it's primary lymphedema uh, in a patient that I had recently who was being treated for upper arm post-mastectomy lymphedema that had venous hypertension, she had axillary stenosis as a result of that, or whether it's in lower extremity uh, lymphedema primary and secondary, a superficial exam isn't going to cut it. And so for those of you who are early in your training, I would strongly recommend that you pursue further training in vascular ultrasonography. If your business plan is to have an RVT or an RVS, that's fine. Most of them come from arterial backgrounds. You're responsible for what they know and what they do. So you have to have a good understanding of venous disease and certainly uh, of venous ultrasonography. This is a financial commitment, it's not a great one. Uh, in the background, uh, this is one of my examining rooms, you see a high-low table. Not all your patients are gonna be obese, but you have to be able to accommodate them. And in the front, a bariatric stool that I love, uh, I, there is no maximum weight on these. I even use it for my superficial reflux patients, uh, and, uh, and the cost of that is quite low as well. Uh, you may have to invest in a console ultrasound. Many of you probably use portable ultrasounds, and you may have to upgrade your ultra, uh, ultrasound. But what's important in this particular picture is notice the number of probes that are there. And since I took this picture, there's another probe that's been added. Why is that? Because you have to be able to insinate the infrapopoteal venous system, especially in patients with, with lymphedema, but also looking for post-thrombotic uh, sources of it, uh, and maybe in some degree, uh, also also uh, coming up with a treatment plan. So it's a commitment and understanding compression needs and options unique to this patient population. We've touched upon that a little bit. There's a list of them right there. I won't go through them, but you have to understand them and know them because, again, what are you doing? You're the primary care provider, and one of the things is your, you know, your treatment plan, and so compression plays a major role in that. But the last line is the most fitting, uh, excuse me, the fitting, the education, and the donning techniques in troubleshooting compression. There's no handing these patients a prescription pad and tell them to go out and get whatever you think they need to be in. That you need to work with them, your staff needs to work with them, it's a major part of my practice. And why? Because compliance is key and it's very easy to lose these patients. They just give up and they feel that they can't follow through, but they will if given the right guidance. We use inelastic adjustable compression, uh, not only lower limb edema, but for, lip, for uh, lymphedema in the thigh, and we've even used it in the upper extremity. I only point that out to, to emphasize how compression is evolving, and this is something that you really need to understand and get involved in. Should, we, uh, should you incorporate a certified lymphedema therapist into your practice, and is it essential to provide CDT in that setting? Andrea gave us a good background on that. I'll, I'll say no, it isn't essential without ex uh, expanding on that for uh, lack of time. But also know that the role of manual lymphatic drainage and compression is evolving. And it's evolving in an exciting way, in way, the way we uh, treat our patients. There are numerous schools of lymphedema training with varying degrees of educational requirement from online courses to minimal weekend clinical exposure to other schools that require weeks and weeks of on-site training, mandatory recertification. Uh, I'm not going to get into them, but buyer beware. If you're going to bring a, a certified lymphedema therapist in your practice, you've got to know what their credentials are. No matter where they come from, um, they also, let me, excuse me, they come from multiple disciplines, from physical therapists, occupational therapists, massage therapists, and RNs. I've seen them all in my practice and, and had uh, contact with them in my practice. I have no prejudice towards any of them other than to say, look for passion. That's what you need to find. You know, you saw it in Andrea, they need to care. Most of them, or a lot of them, have had personal experiences with lymphedema, and those are the people that you want in your practice and working for you. Wherever they come from, I recommend that they be LANA certified or become LANA certified, not only for the prerequisites of 
passing the examination, but also because it says something else about him, that lymphedema is a commitment. It's a career commitment and not just a a side uh, endeavor. The advantages of a a CLT, uh, it emphasizes the team approach, which is so important. It assumes aspects of lymphedema care that you can't and probably don't want to get involved in. It brands and adds credibility to your center, and there may be some financial advantages and disadvantages, which I won't go into. You have to develop relationships with all these disciplines. Uh, You are the primary care provider in lymphedema. You need to be able to pick up the phone, and if you're in Palo Alto, you, you know, you have no problem. If you're in Columbus, Ohio, you have no problem. You really have to seek out these individuals. Tertiary care specialists, not only uh, that treat these patients, but lymphedema surgeons, pick up the phone and say, hey, is my can- uh, patient a candidate for a lymph node transfer? And the rest uh, you can read here. So I'll end by saying, does it make sense for your practice? Well, it'll open up an entirely new referral base, not predicated on you you're being a vein doc, but truly a specialist in the care of a complex group of patients in whom primary care providers desperately need your assistance. So this may be a little self-serving in, the, in, uh, in terms of the quote. I'll let you read it. I've been practicing surgery for over 25 years, and I have to say this truly touched me. And, you know, a lot of things when I first started practicing surgery, I thought I knew, and now I have no idea about it. I've been wrong about a lot of that. But two things I do know about lymphedema care. If you open your doors, these patients will come. They'll not only come, they'll flood in, and they desperately, desperately need your help. So I end all my talks with this slide, which is certainly pertinent to the lymphedema patient as well. And hopefully I spoke fast enough to uh, catch up a little bit, uh, Stanley. Thank you. I'll invite the other speakers up, um, if you all have a few moments. And we're happy to answer any questions for any of the panelists, please. I have uh, uh, one question over here, out, out in the back here. Okay. Um, as far as ICD-10 codes, you know, that's always a struggle uh, in documentation. You know, lipedema, can't find it. Uh, there actually, it is there one? Yes, but okay. you have to spell it L-I-P-O-E-D-E-M-A. Got it. Thank you. Yes. And then, uh, then combining flebo lymphedema, lipo, you know, all of that yeah. stuff. And uh, but the, the, there is an ICD nine. I don't remember the number, but that's how I find it in our electronic medical Great. record. Thank you. I have a question. question. Here. Yes. Uh, when you diagnose flebo lymphedema, what level of the vein venous system is damaged? Because oftentimes, when you scan patients, their saphenous veins are fine. They don't have any big giant varicose veins. So what, other than the skin changes that suggest phlebo-lymphedema, where's the damage to the venous system? In the scenario you're describing, I would suggest you it's probably a, an obese or morbidly obese patient. Most of the time. And um, that's not uncommon. I mean, you'll see these people with a BMI of 50, and you cannot demonstrate reflux on them. But there's a lot of potential pathophysiologies, but probably it's the weight uh, of the admin and pelvis compressing on the iliocaval system that's obstructing it and uh, causing venous incompetency. A lot of those people that are really big, BMIs of 50, as you know, they're not essentially mobile, so their calf muscle pump is dysfunctional. That also leads to stasis changes as well. Other questions? Yes. Application coming out for the non stroidals and lymphedema? Uh, so that one is in, in manuscript writing uh, phase, and we're hoping to submit it by early December, I would hope. So it should be out uh, in the early months of next year. The basic paper where we explored the leukotriene B4 uh, uh, pathways in the mouse model um, is being submitted next week. And if all goes well, Let's hope six or eight weeks from now, but I, that's very optimistic. And in uh, what journal should we be looking for it? I better not say because we're aiming high, but we may not get that far. Fair enough. <laughs> I tried. Um, this has been an excellent session, by the way. Thank you. Uh, just a question about Abenimex. Um, have any other leukotriene receptor uh, antagonists been looked at? I'm thinking of Montelukast. Yeah, we looked in the mouse model, and what I can tell you in summary is that 
the, the non-steroidal that we use that is a, that is a dual uh, antagonist of both lipooxygenase and COX-1-2 works. Direct 5-LO antagonists work, so that's very upstream of leukotriene B4. But once you develop, once 5-LO generates leukotriene A4, it's a very unstable a molecule that either goes into the leukotriene B pathway or the C pathway. So Montelukast is a leukotriene C antagonist and does not work. And that's how we pretty much confirmed, or many of the, one of the routes in which we confirmed that leukotriene B4 um, you know, was the causative agent. Okay, uh, thank you. And we heard elsewhere that ketoprofen has been... That's the non-steroidal. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying not to use the name because I'm trying not to encourage people to, at least till we demonstrate safety and efficacy. I mean, one of the reasons we're excited to find the leukotriene uh, opportunity is that um, even though the ketoprofen data is very exciting, as many of you know, last summer um, the FDA uh, released a general advisory about NSAIDs specifically related to cardiovascular health. And so for long-term use, and a lot of these patients that we're talking about have other reasons to at least be wary about cardiovascular issues. It may not be the ideal. Um, unfortunately, they, they did that to me as I was terminating my study. But, um, but the leukotrienes apparently are, um, or let's say Ubenimex is devoid of that concern because it doesn't share any of those properties. All right, thank you. Okay, last chance. We've got an Academy Award winner here. Does anyone ask anything? Okay, thank you so much for coming to the session.